I kinds. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, Chapter Nineteen. I look about me and make a discovery. I am doubtful whether I was at heart glad or sorry when my school days drew to an end and the time came for my leaving Doctor Strong's. I had been very happy there. I had a great attachment for the doctor, and I was eminent and distinguished in that little world. For these reasons I was sorry to go, but for other reasons, unsubstantial enough, I was glad. Misty ideas of being a young man at my own disposal, of the importance attaching to a young man at his own disposal, of the wonderful things to be seen and done by that magnificent animal, and the wonderful effects he could not fail to make upon society, lured me away. So powerful were these visionary considerations in my boyish mind, that I seem, according to my present way of thinking, to have left school without natural regret. The separation has not made the impression on me that other separations have. I try in vain to recall how I felt about it and what its circumstances were, but it is not momentous in my recollection. I suppose the opening prospect confused me. I know that my juvenile experiences went for little or nothing then, and that life was more like a great fairy story which I was just about to begin to read than anything else. My aunt and I had held a great many deliberations on the calling to which I should be devoted. For a year or more I had endeavoured to find a satisfactory answer to her often repeated question, what should I like to be? But I had no particular liking that I could discover for anything. If I could have been inspired with a knowledge of the science of navigation, taken the command of a fast-sailing expedition, and gone round the world on a triumphant voyage of discovery, I think I might have considered myself completely suited. But in absence of any such miraculous provision, my desire was to apply myself to some pursuit that would not lie too heavily upon her purse, and to do my duty in it, whatever it might be. Mr. Dick had regularly assisted at our councils with a meditative and sage demeanour. He never made a suggestion but once, and on that occasion, I don't know what put it in his head, he suddenly proposed that I should be a brazier. My aunt received this proposal so very ungraciously that he never ventured on a second, but ever afterwards confined himself to looking watchfully at her for her suggestions and rattling his money. "'Trot, I'll tell you what, my dear.' said my aunt one morning in the Christmas season when I left school. As this knotty point is still unsettled, and we must not make a mistake in our decision if we can help it, I think we had better take a little breathing time. In the meanwhile, you must try to look at it from a new point of view, and not as a schoolboy. I will, aunt. It has occurred to me, pursued my aunt, that a little change and a glimpse of life out of doors may be useful in helping you to know your own mind, and form a cooler judgment. Suppose you were to go down into that old part of the country again, for instance, and see that, that out-of-the-way woman with the savagest of names, said my aunt, rubbing her nose, for she could never thoroughly forgive Peggotty for being so called. Of all things in the world, aunt, I should like it best. Well, said my aunt, that's lucky, for I should like it too. But it's natural and rational that you should like it, and I am very well persuaded that whatever you do, Trot, will always be natural and rational. I hope so, aunt. Your sister, Betsy Trotwood, said my aunt, would have been as natural and rational a girl as ever breathed. You'll be worthy of her, won't you? I hope I shall be worthy of you, aunt. That will be enough for me. It's a mercy that poor baby of a mother of yours didn't live, said my aunt, looking at me approvingly, or she'd have been so vain of her boy by this time that her soft little head would have been completely turned, if there was anything of it left to turn. A man always excused any weakness of her own in my behalf by transferring it in this way to my poor mother. Bless me, Trotwood, how you do remind me of her. Pleasantly, I hope, aunt, I said. He's as like her, Dick, said my aunt emphatically. He's as like her as she was that afternoon before she began to fret. Bless my heart, he's as like her as he can look at me out of his two eyes. Is he indeed? said Mr. Dick. "'And he's like David, too,' said my aunt decisively. "'He's very like David,' said Mr. Dick. "'But what I want you to be, Trot,' resumed my aunt, "'I don't mean physically, but morally, you are very well physically, "'is a firm fellow, a fine firm fellow with a will of your own, with resolution.' 
said my aunt, shaking her cap at me and clenching her hand. With determination, with character, Trot, with strength of character that will not be influenced except on good reason by anybody or by anything. That's what I want you to be. That's what your father and mother might both have been, heaven knows, and been the better for it. I intimated that I hoped I should be what she described. That you may begin, in a small way, to have a reliance upon yourself and to act for yourself, said my aunt. I shall send you upon your trip alone. I did think once of Mr. Dick's going with you, but on second thoughts I shall keep him to take care of me. Mr. Dick for a moment looked a little disappointed, until the honour and dignity of having to take care of the most wonderful woman in the world restored the sunshine to his face. Besides, said my aunt, there's the memorial. Oh, certainly, said Mr. Dick in a hurry. I intend, Trotwood, to get that done immediately. It really must be done immediately, and then it will go in, you know. And then, said Mr. Dick, after checking himself and pausing a long time, there will be a pretty kettle of fish. In pursuance of my aunt's second scheme, I was shortly afterwards fitted with a handsome purse of money and a portmanteau, and tenderly dismissed upon my expedition. At parting, my aunt gave me some good advice, and a good many kisses, and said that as her object was that I should look about me, and should think a little, she would recommend me to stay a few days in London, if I liked it, either on my way down to Suffolk, or in coming back. In a word, I was at liberty to do what I would, for three weeks or a month and no other conditions were imposed upon my freedom than the before-mentioned thinking and looking about me, and a pledge to write three times a week and faithfully report myself. I went to Canterbury first, that I might take leave of Agnes and Mr. Wickfield, of my old room in whose house I had not yet relinquished, and also of the good doctor. Agnes was very glad to see me, and told me that the house had not been like itself since I had left it. "'I am sure I am not like myself when I am away,' said I. "'I seem to want my right hand when I miss you, though that's not saying much, for there's no head in my right hand and no heart. Everyone who knows you consults with you and is guided by you, Agnes.' "'Everyone who knows me spoils me, I believe,' she answered, smiling. "'No, it's because you are like no one else. You are so good and so sweet-tempered. You have such a gentle nature, and you are always right. You talk.' said Agnes, breaking into a pleasant laugh as she sat at work, as if I were the late Miss Larkins. "'Come, it's not fair to abuse my confidence,' I answered, reddening at the recollection of my blue enslaver. "'But I shall confide in you just the same, Agnes. I can never grow out of that. Whenever I fall into trouble or fall in love, I shall always tell you, if you will let me, even when I come to fall in love in earnest.' "'Why, you have always been in earnest,' said Agnes, laughing again. "'Oh, that was as a child or a schoolboy,' said I, laughing in my turn, not without being a little shamefaced. "'Times are altering now, and I suppose I shall be in a terrible state of earnestness one day or other. My wonder is that you are not in earnest yourself by this time, Agnes.' Agnes laughed again and shook her head. "'Oh, I know you are not,' said I, "'because if you had been you would have told me, or at least, for I saw a faint blush in her face, you would have let me find it out for myself.' But there is no one that I know of who deserves to love you, Agnes. Someone of a nobler character and more worthy altogether than any one I have ever seen here must rise up before I give my consent. In the time to come I shall have a wary eye on all admirers, and exact a great deal from the successful one, I assure you. We had gone on so far in a mixture of confidential jest and earnest that had long grown naturally out of our familiar relations, begun as mere children. But Agnes, now suddenly lifting up her eyes to mine and speaking in a different manner, said, "'Trotwood, there's something that I want to ask you, and that I may not have another opportunity of asking for a long time, perhaps. Something I would ask, I think, of no one else. Have you observed any gradual alteration in Papa?' I had observed it, and had often wondered whether she had, too. I must have shown as much now in my face, for her eyes were in a moment cast down and I saw tears in them. "'Tell me what it is,' she said in a low voice. "'I think. Shall I be quite plain, Agnes, liking him so much?' "'Yes,' she said. "'I think he does himself no good by the habit that has increased upon him since I first came here. 
he is often very nervous, or I fancy so. It is not fancy, said Agnes, shaking her head. His hand trembles, his speech is not plain, and his eyes look wild. I have remarked that at those times, and when he is least like himself, he is most certain to be wanted on some business. By Uriah, said Agnes. Yes, and the sense of being unfit for it, or of not having understood it, or of having shown his condition in spite of himself, seems to make him so uneasy that next day he is worse, and next day worse, and so he becomes jaded and haggard. Do not be alarmed by what I say, Agnes, but in this state I saw him only the other evening lay down his head upon his desk and shed tears like a child. Her hand passed softly before my lips while I was yet speaking, and in a moment she had met her father at the door of the room and was hanging upon his shoulder. The expression of her face as they both looked towards me I felt to be very touching. There was such deep fondness for him and gratitude to him for all his love and care in her beautiful look and there was such a fervent appeal to me to deal tenderly by him, even in my inmost thoughts, and to let no harsh construction find any place against him. She was at once so proud of him and devoted to him, yet so compassionate and sorry and so reliant upon me to be so too, that nothing she could have said would have expressed more to me or moved me more. We were to drink tea at the doctor's. We went there at the usual hour, and round the study fireside found the doctor and his young wife and her mother. The doctor, who made as much of my going as if I were going to China, received me as an honoured guest, and called for a log of wood to be thrown on the fire that he might see the face of his old pupil reddening in the blaze. "'I shall not see many more new faces in Trotwoodstead, Wickfield,' said the doctor, warming his hands. "'I am getting lazy, and I want ease.' I shall relinquish all my young people in another six months, and lead a quieter life. You have said so any time these ten years, doctor, Mr. Wickfield answered. But now I mean to do it, returned the doctor. My first master will succeed me. I am in earnest at last. So you'll soon have to arrange our contracts, and to bind us firmly to them like a couple of knaves. And to take care said Mr. Wickfield, that you are not imposed upon, eh? As you certainly would be in any contract you should make for yourself. Well, I am ready. There are worse tasks than that in my calling. I shall have nothing to think of then, said the doctor with a smile, but my dictionary, and this other contract bargain, Annie. As Mr. Wickfield glanced towards her, sitting at the tea-table by Agnes, she seemed to me to avoid his look with such unwonted hesitation and timidity that his attention became fixed upon her, as if something were suggested to his thoughts. "'There is a post come in from India, I observe,' he said after a short silence. "'By the by, and letters from Mr. Jack Malden,' said the doctor. "'Indeed, poor dear Jack,' said Mrs. Markleham, shaking her head. "'That trying climate, like living, they tell me, on a sand-heap underneath a burning-glass. He looked strong, but he wasn't.' My dear doctor, it was his spirit, not his constitution, that he ventured on so boldly. Annie, my dear, I am sure you must perfectly recollect that your cousin never was strong. Not what could be called robust, you know, said Mrs. Markleham, with emphasis, looking round upon us generally, from the time when my daughter and himself were children together, and walking about arm in arm the live-long day. Annie, thus addressed, made no reply. Do I gather from what you say, ma'am, that Mr. Malden is ill? asked Mr. Wickfield. Ill, replied the old soldier. My dear sir, he's all sorts of things. Except well, said Mr. Wickfield. Except well, indeed, said the old soldier. He has had dreadful strokes of the sun, no doubt, and jungle fevers and agues and every kind of thing you can mention. As to his liver, said the old soldier resignedly, that, of course, he gave up altogether when he first went out. Does he say all this? asked Mr. Wickfield. "'Say, my dear sir,' returned Mrs. Markleham, shaking her head and her fan. "'You little know my poor Jack Malden when you ask that question. Say, not he. You might drag him at the heels of four wild horses first. Mamma, said Mrs. Strong. "'Annie, my dear,' returned her mother, "'once for all I must really beg that you will not interfere with me unless it is to confirm what I say.' 
you know as well as i do that your cousin maldon would be dragged at the heels of any number of wild horses why should i confine myself to four i won't confine myself to four eight sixteen two and thirty rather than say anything calculated to overturn the doctor's plans uh, wickfield's plans said the doctor stroking his face and looking penitently at his adviser uh, that is to say our joint plans for him i said myself abroad or at home and i said said mr wickfield gravely abroad i was the means of sending him abroad it's my responsibility oh responsibility said the old soldier everything was done for the best my dear mr wickfield everything was done for the kindest and best we know but if the dear fellow can't live there he can't live there and if he can't live there he'll die there sooner than he'll overturn the doctor's plans i know him said the old soldier fanning herself in a sort of calm prophetic agony and i know he'll die there sooner than he'll overturn the doctor's plans well well ma'am said the doctor cheerfully i am not bigoted to my plans i can overturn them myself i can substitute some other plans if mr jack maldon comes home on account of ill health he must not be allowed to go back and we must endeavour to make some more suitable and fortunate provision for him in this country mrs markleham was so overcome by this generous speech which i need not say she had not at all expected or led up to that she could only tell the doctor it was like himself and go several times through that operation of kissing the stick of her fan and then tapping his hand with it after which she gently chid her daughter annie for not being more demonstrative when such kindnesses were showered for her sake on her old playfellow and entertained us with some particulars concerning other deserving members of her family whom it was desirable to set on their deserving legs all this time her daughter annie never once spoke or lifted up her eyes all this time mr wickfield had his glance upon her as she sat by his own daughter's side it appeared to me that he never thought of being observed by any one but was so intent upon her and upon his own thoughts in connection with her as to be quite absorbed he now asked what mr jack maldon had actually written in reference to himself and to whom he had written why here said mrs markleham taking a letter from the chimney-piece above the doctor's head the dear fellow says to the doctor himself where is it oh i am sorry to inform you that my health is suffering severely and that i fear i may be reduced to the necessity of returning home for a time as the only hope of restoration that's pretty plain poor fellow his only hope of restoration but annie's letter is plainer still annie show me the letter again oh, not now mamma she pleaded in a low tone my dear you absolutely are on some subjects one of the most ridiculous persons in the world returned her mother and perhaps the most unnatural to the claims of your own family we never should have heard of the letter at all i believe unless i asked for it myself do you call that confidence my love towards dr strong i am surprised you ought to know better the letter was reluctantly produced and as i handed it to the old lady i saw how the unwilling hand from which i took it trembled now let us see said mrs markleham putting her glass to her eye where the passage is the remembrance of old times my dearest annie and so forth it's not there the amiable old proctor who's he dear annie how illegibly your cousin maldon writes and how stupid i am doctor of course ah amiable indeed and here she left off to kiss her fan again and shake it at the doctor who was looking at us in a state of placid satisfaction now i have found it you may not be surprised to hear annie no to be sure knowing that he never really was strong what did i just say now that i have undergone so much in this distant place as to have decided to leave it at all hazards on sick leave if i can on total resignation if that is not to be obtained what i have endured and do endure here is insupportable and but for the promptitude of that best of creatures said mrs markleham telegraphing the doctor as before and refolding the letter it would be insupportable to me to think of mr wickfield said not one word though the old lady looked to him as if for his commentary on this intelligence but sat severely silent with his eyes fixed on the ground long after the subject was dismissed and other topics occupied us he remained so seldom raising his eyes unless to rest them for a moment with a thoughtful frown upon the doctor or his wife or both the doctor was very fond of music 
Agnes sang with great sweetness and expression, and so did Mrs. Strong. They sang together and played duets together, and we had quite a little concert. But I remarked two things. First, that though Annie soon recovered her composure, and was quite herself, there was a blank between herself and Mr. Wickfield which separated them wholly from each other. Secondly, that Mr. Wickfield seemed to dislike the intimacy between her and Agnes, and to watch it with uneasiness. And now, I must confess, the recollection of what I had seen on that night when Mr. Malden went away first began to return upon me with a meaning it had never had, and to trouble me. The innocent beauty of her face was not as innocent to me as it had been. I mistrusted the natural grace and charm of her manner, and when I looked at Agnes by her side and thought how good and true Agnes was, suspicions arose within me that it was an ill-assorted friendship. She was so happy in it herself, however, and the other was so happy too, that they made the evening fly away as if it were but an hour. It closed in an incident which I well remember. They were taking leave of each other, and Agnes was going to embrace and kiss her, when Mr. Wickfield stepped between them, as if by accident, and drew Agnes quickly away. Then I saw, as though all the intervening time had been cancelled, and I were still standing in the doorway on the night of the departure, the expression of that night in the face of Mrs. Strong, as it confronted his. I cannot say what an impression this made upon me, or how impossible I found it when I thought of her afterwards, to separate her from this look, and remember her face in its innocent loveliness again. It haunted me when I got home. I seem to have left the doctor's roof with a dark cloud lowering on it. The reverence that I had for his grey head was mingled with commiseration for his faith in those who were treacherous to him, and with resentment against those who injured him. The impending shadow of a great affliction, and the great disgrace that had no distinct form in it yet, fell like a stain upon the quiet place where I had worked and played as a boy, and did it a cruel wrong. I had no pleasure in thinking any more of the grave old broad-leaved aloe-trees which remained shut up in themselves a hundred years together, and of the trim smooth grass-plot, and the stone urns, and the doctor's walk, and the congenial sound of the cathedral bell hovering above them all. It was as if the tranquil sanctuary of my boyhood had been sacked before my face, and its peace and honour given to the winds. But morning brought with it my parting from the old house, which Agnes had filled with her influence, and that occupied my mind sufficiently. I should be there again soon, no doubt. I might sleep again, perhaps often, in my old room. But the days of my inhabiting there were gone, and the old time was past. I was heavier at heart when I packed up such of my books and clothes as still remained there to be sent to Dover, than I cared to show to Uriah Heap who was so officious to help me that I uncharitably thought he might be glad I was going. I got away from Agnes and her father somehow with an indifferent show of being very manly, and took my seat upon the box of the London coach. I was so softened and forgiving going through the town that I had half a mind to nod to my old enemy the butcher and throw him five shillings to drink, but he looked such a very obdurate butcher as he stood scraping the great block in the shop, and moreover his appearance was so little improved by the loss of a front tooth which I had knocked out, that I thought it best to make no advances. The main object on my mind, I remember, when we got fairly on the road, was to appear as old as possible to the coachman, and to speak extremely gruff. The latter point I achieved at great personal inconvenience, but I stuck to it because I felt it was a grown-up sort of a thing. "'Are you going through, sir?' said the coachman. "'Yes, William,' I said condescendingly. I knew him. "'I am going to London. I shall go down into Suffolk afterwards.' "'Shooting, sir?' said the coachman. He knew as well as I did that it was just as likely at that time of year I was going down there whaling, but I felt complimented, too. "'I don't know.' I said, pretending to be undecided, whether I shall take a shot or not. "'Birds has got very shy, I'm told,' said William. "'So I understand,' said I. "'Is Suffolk your county, sir?' asked William. "'Yes,' I said with some importance. "'Suffolk's my county.' "'I've told the dumplings is uncommon fine down there,' said William. I was not aware of it myself, but I felt it necessary to uphold the institutions of my county, and to evince a familiarity with them, so I shook my head as much as to say, I believe you. 
and the punches said william there's cattle a suffolk punch when he's a good un is worth his weight in gold did you ever breed any suffolk punches yourself sir no i said not exactly here's a gentleman behind me i'll pound it said william as has bred him by old sale the gentleman spoken of was a gentleman with a very unpromising squint and a prominent chin who had a tall white hat on with a narrow flat brim and whose close-fitting drab trousers seemed to button all the way up outside his legs from his boots to his hips his chin was cocked over the coachman's shoulder so near to me that his breath quite tickled the back of my head and as i looked at him he leered at the leaders with the eye with which he didn't squint in a very knowing manner ain't you asked william ain't i what said the gentleman behind bred them suffolk punches old sale i should think so said the gentleman there ain't no sort of horse that i ain't bred there ain't no sort of dog horses and dogs is some men's fancy they're wittles and drink to me lodgings wife and children reading writing and arithmetic snuff tobacco and sleep that ain't the sort of man to see sitting behind a coach box is it though said william in my ear as he handled the reins i construed this remark into an indication of a wish that he should have my place so i blushingly offered to resign it well if you don't mind sir said william i think it would be more correct i have always considered this as the first fall i had in life when i booked my place at the coach office i had had box seat written against the entry and had given the bookkeeper half a crown i was got up in a special greatcoat and shawl expressly to do honour to that distinguished eminence had glorified myself upon it a good deal and had felt that i was a credit to the coach and here in the very first stage i was supplanted by a shabby man with a squint who had no other merit than smelling like a livery stables and being able to walk across me more like a fly than a human being while the horses were at a canter a distrust of myself which has often beset me in life on small occasions and when it should have been better away was assuredly not stopped in its growth by this little incident outside the canterbury coach it was in vain to take refuge in gruffness of speech i spoke from the pit of my stomach for the rest of the journey but i felt completely extinguished and dreadfully young it was curious and interesting, nevertheless, to be sitting up there behind four horses, well-educated, well-dressed, and with plenty of money in my pocket, and to look out for the places where I had slept on my weary journey. I had abundant occupation for my thoughts, in every conspicuous landmark on the road. When I looked down at the trampers whom we passed, and saw that well-remembered style of face turned up, I felt as if the tinker's blackened hand were in the bosom of my shirt again when we clattered through the narrow street of chatham and i caught a glimpse in passing of the lane where the old monster lived who had bought my jacket i stretched my neck eagerly to look for the place where i had sat in the sun and in the shade waiting for my money when we came at last within a stage of london and passed the veritable salem house where mr creakle had laid about him with a heavy hand i would have given all i had for lawful permission to get down and thrash him and let all the boys out like so many caged sparrows we went to the golden cross at charing cross then a mouldy sort of establishment in a close neighbourhood a waiter showed me to the coffee-room, and a chambermaid introduced me to my small bedchamber, which smelt like a hackney-coach, and was shut up like a family vault. I was still painfully conscious of my youth, for nobody stood in any awe of me at all, the chambermaid being utterly indifferent to my opinions on any subject, and the waiter being familiar with me, and offering advice to my inexperience. "'Well, now,' said the waiter, in a tone of confidence, what would you like for dinner? Young gentlemen likes poultry in general. Have a fowl. I told him as majestically as I could that I wasn't in the humour for a fowl. Ain't you? said the waiter. Young gentlemen is generally tired of beef and mutton. Have a wheel cutlet. I assented to this proposal, in default of being able to suggest anything else. Do you care for taters? said the waiter, with an insinuating smile and his head on one side. A young gentleman generally has been overdosed with taters i commanded him in my deepest voice to order a veal cutlet and potatoes 
and all things fitting, and to inquire at the bar if there were any letters for Trotwood Copperfield, Esquire, which I knew there were not, and couldn't be, but thought it manly to appear to expect. He soon came back to say that there were none, at which I was much surprised, and began to lay the cloth for my dinner in a box by the fire. While he was so engaged, he asked me what I would take with it, and on my replying, half a pint of sherry, I thought it a favourable opportunity, I am afraid, to extract that measure of wine from the stale leavings at the bottoms of several small decanters. I am of this opinion because, while I was reading the newspaper, I observed him behind a low wooden partition, which was his private apartment, very busy pouring out of a number of those vessels into one, like a chemist and druggist making up a prescription. When the wine came to, I thought it flat, and it certainly had more English crumbs in it than were to be expected in a foreign wine in anything like a pure state. But I was bashful enough to drink it and say nothing. Being in a pleasant frame of mind, from which I infer that poisoning is not always disagreeable in some stages of the process, I resolved to go to the play. It was Covent Garden Theatre that I chose, and there, from the back of a centre box, I saw Julius Caesar and the new pantomime. To have all those noble Romans alive before me, and walking in and out for my entertainment, instead of being the stern taskmasters they had been at school, was a most novel and delightful effect. But the mingled reality and mystery of the whole show, the influence upon me of the poetry, the lights, the music, the company, and the smooth, stupendous changes of glittering and brilliant scenery, were so dazzling, and opened up such illimitable regions of delight, that when I came out into the rainy street, at twelve o'clock at night, I felt as if I had come from the clouds, where I had been leading a romantic life for ages, to a bawling, splashing, link-lighted, umbrella, struggling, hackney-coach, jostling, patent-clinking, muddy, miserable world. I had emerged by another door, and stood in the street for a little while, as if I really were a stranger upon earth, but the unceremonious pushing and hustling that I received soon recalled me to myself, and put me in the road back to my hotel, whither I went revolving the glorious visions all the way, and where, after some porter and oysters, I sat revolving it still at past one o'clock with my eyes on the coffee-room fire. I was so filled with the play and with the past, for it was in a manner like a shining transparency through which I saw my earlier life moving along, that I don't know when the figure of a handsome, well-formed young man, dressed with a tasteful, easy negligence which I have reason to remember very well, became a real presence to me but I recollect being conscious of his company without having noticed his coming in, and my still sitting musing over the coffee-room fire. At last I rose to go to bed, much to the relief of the sleepy waiter who had got the fidgets in his legs and was twisting them and hitting them and putting them through all kinds of contortions in his small pantry. In going towards the door I passed the person who had come in and saw him plainly. I turned directly, came back and looked again. He did not know me, but I knew him in a moment. At another time I might have wanted the confidence or the decision to speak to him, and might have put it off till next day, and might have lost him. But in the then condition of my mind, where the play was still running high, his former protection of me appeared so deserving of my gratitude, and my old love for him overflowed my breast so freshly and spontaneously, that I went up to him at once with a fast-beating heart and said, "'Steer forth!' "'Won't you speak to me?' He looked at me, just as he used to look sometimes, but I saw no recognition in his face. "'You don't remember me, I'm afraid,' I said. "'My God!' he suddenly exclaimed. "'It's little Copperfield!' I grasped him by both hands and could not let him go. But for very shame and the fear that it might displease him, I could have held him round the neck and cried. "'I never, never, never was so glad!' my dear Steerforth, I am so overjoyed to see you. I am as rejoiced to see you too, he said, shaking my hands heartily. Why, Copperfield, old boy, don't be so overpowered. And yet he was glad too, I thought, to see how the delight I had in meeting him affected me. I brushed away the tears that my utmost resolution had not been able to keep back, and made a clumsy laugh at it, and we sat down together, side by side. Why, how do you come to be here? said Steerforth, clapping me on the shoulder. 
I came here by the Canterbury coach today. I have been adopted by an aunt down in that part of the country, and have just finished my education there. How do you come to be here, Steerforth? Well, I am what they call an Oxford man, he returned. That is to say, I get bored to death down there periodically, and I am on my way now to my mother's. You're a devilish amiable-looking fellow, Copperfield. Just what you used to be now I look at you, not altered in the least. I knew you immediately, I said, but you are more easily remembered. He laughed as he ran his hand through the clustering curls of his hair, and said gaily, Yes, I am on an expedition of duty. My mother lives a little way out of town, and the roads being in a beastly condition, and our house tedious enough, I remained here to-night instead of going on. I have not been in town half a dozen hours, and those I have been dozing and grumbling away at the play. I have been to the play, too, said I, at Covent Garden. What a delightful and magnificent entertainment, Steerforth. Steerforth laughed heartily. Uh, my dear young Davy, he said, clasping me on the shoulder again, you are a very daisy. The daisy of the field at sunrise is not fresher than you are. I have been at Covent Garden, too, and there never was a more miserable business. Hello, you saw. This was addressed to the waiter, who had been very attentive to our recognition, at a distance, and now came forward deferentially. "'Where have you put my friend, Mr. Copperfield?' said Steerforth. "'Beg your pardon, sir.' Uh, "'Where did he sleep? What's his number? You know what I mean,' said Steerforth. "'Well, sir.' said the waiter, with an apologetic air. Mr. Copperfield is at present in forty-four, sir. What the devil do you mean, said Steerforth, by putting Mr. Copperfield into a little loft over a stable? Why, you see, we wasn't aware, sir, returned the waiter, still apologetically, as Mr. Copperfield was anyways particular. We can give Mr. Copperfield seventy-two, sir, if it would be preferred. Next to you, sir. Of course it would be preferred, said Steerforth, and do it at once. The waiter immediately withdrew to make the exchange. Steerforth, very much amused at my having been put into forty-four, laughed again, and clapped me on the shoulder again, and invited me to breakfast with him next morning at ten o'clock, an invitation I was only too proud and happy to accept. It being pretty late, we took our candles and went upstairs, where we parted with friendly heartiness at his door, and where I found my new room a great improvement on my old one, it not being at all musty, and having an immense four-post bedstead in it, which was quite a little landed estate. Here, among pillows enough for six, I soon fell asleep in a blissful condition, and dreamed of ancient Rome, Steerforth, and friendship until the early morning coaches rumbling out of the archway beneath made me dream of thunder and the gods. End of chapter 19